Um, so yeah, so I, I dealt with this um, modern Node.js backend development. So um, I don't know if I qualify as a backend developer at this point. Um, I only started working with Node like three or four months ago. Um, but I've learned like a bunch of interesting things, um, like trying to set it up efficiently and integrating into into my infrastructure and all of that. So this is going to be basically like a case study of of Core Backend. Um, so if you don't know, Core Backend is this server that we're running. It's um, supporting the Core protocol, um, like heartbeats and like a bunch of stuff that needs to run periodically. Um, also, if you want to enable auto reveals or have notification subscriptions in the client, um, basically this is all handled by the by the core backend. So we have it here, and and yeah. So basically, there's a bunch of different parts, um, and yeah. So in this, I have. Uh, I have four different topics that I want to go through. So first, um, contain containerization, um, testing, CI, CD, and metrics. And I know the backend can be a bit boring, so there's going to be some sexy live grabs at the end. So it's, it's going to be totally worth it. Um, so yeah, and, and also I want to get some, some discussion going because, yeah, like for example, in terms of structuring your code and testing and stuff. I mean, it, it, it can be done in many different ways. So yeah, well, let's see where we go. Um, so yeah, so first, um, containerization. So just a quick uh, recap. So why do we want containers in the first place? Um, so I think that these are probably the most valuable points. So first of all, we have the same environment in development and production, no external dependencies. So you can have an app with everything that it needs to be run. Just launch it on your laptop, launch it on the server. It's all the same. You don't need to worry about all funky dependencies and getting everything together. So um, it just really saves a lot of pain. I mean, you know, like all the rage, everyone's using Docker these days. Everyone's using Kubernetes. So I mean, these are the reasons because it's just it just solves all of these um, problems that we were having. So basically, you can treat an app and its environment as a single entity without anything external. So this was a huge deal, which is why containers exploded. Um, and also, yeah, they can be easily scalable using orchestrators such as Kubernetes. So if I just have a container, I can say I want a thousand containers and it's gonna be a load balanced, scaled almost instantaneously. So yeah, we can do a lot of things with containers. Um, so yeah, so you so when I joined, um, you were using this um, monorepo type of pattern for your for your um, well for all your Arab and stuff. Basically, you're, you're like using these uh, monorepos. So um, so so yeah, I was a bit um, not sure like how how do we transfer this type of architecture into containers but um, actually there is it's perfectly fine to use uh, uh, the whole basically monorepo as a container so basically we just take the whole repo and we just copy different packages from different directories and then just run learn a bootstrap at the end and then upload this container to the registry and basically you have your whole um, repo as a single container and then basically the same container can become several different things so in our case it's three different things so i have my mono repo docker file and then what we do is we just initialize it with a specific comments so it can become a rest api it can become service workers and it can also can be on come this back office app at uh, these um urls so so this is was um like i i actually haven't seen any other examples doing this kind of thing so i think this is kind of interesting because you get like benefits of the monorepo you know everything is in place it's easier to like handle dependencies 
uh, but we still have these basically single process model, just you know, very tightly focused containers doing one specific thing. So, um, yeah, I remember uh, reading that um, Grafana, uh, they were doing something like this with their backend um, when they were, um, uh, they're developing these apps in Go and what they, they call this like microlith, uh, uh, which is, you know, a monolith is like a single app which does many different things and the microservices is like very focused apps. So basically it's like a hybrid, you know, like we have a big code base, but then we initialize it however we want. So um, I think I think this is very interesting. Um, so we get like best of both worlds, I would say. So I, I really like this pattern. So um, yeah, we can we can just keep using it in like if we need some other backend stuff. Um, um, yeah, so there are also some um, say mistakes that we made, um, like maybe we just didn't think about it in the beginning. Um, like for example, for the service worker, um, we have multiple processes which are actually being forked in this, in this line here. And this is actually not ideal because of how you are running containers um, in Kubernetes, for example, because all these container managers, they're really good at um, sort of taking care of a single process. So if you have a container and that container is a single process, and for example, there's an error, it goes down, Kubernetes will automatically restart it. In this case, it doesn't actually work because we have like five different workers. So if one worker goes down, like Kubernetes doesn't really know about it. So like this is not ideal. So this is something to think about. It's always better to have like one specifically focused process per container. So this is something that we can improve, I think. Um, yeah, this is also another thing. Um, so the way we're running containers at the moment, this is not actually scalable. Like, let's say we have a million users. I cannot just say, let's just run 100 containers. Because, for example, we have this kind of, this kind of guys. So, for example, this is um, an action that happens when we create a new um, uh, a new subscription. So I see if the user exists, I insert the line, and I send them a verification email. So imagine there are two containers or 100 containers, and they're all executing this function at the same time. We're going to send 100 emails. So like this is not this is not ideal. So um, so I guess there are two ways to do it. Like one would be to have some kind of transactional model for like multiple queries, but I think that will get like very complicated. So I think if we want to scale, we should think about using some kind of message broker, um, like, um, I don't know, RabbitMQ, for example, comes to mind. So uh, then we can have like multiple apps subscribe to the event and it just makes sure that there's only a single, um, there's only a single container which holds the event. So yeah, that would be something to think about in the future because yeah, and um, yeah, we, we just, we just cannot scale it at the moment. So, well, we don't need it because, you know, Laravel doesn't have like a million users, but uh, something that we can improve. Um, so yeah, that's all I wanted to say about containers. Um, so like, do you have any questions? Um, do you want something to, to clarify, something to add? Yeah, I had a couple on the message broker. Um, one, could we all right. All right. help? Yeah, one is, uh, could we uh, continue defining the message broker uh, for those who might be unfam unfamiliar with the concept? And then two is, uh, I'm not sure I understand how that would solve the scaling problem uh, here. Um, so so what I was thinking um, is, um, yeah, so, so basically the problem here is that if we have multiple containers, they will try to execute this functions at the same time. So a message broker is something that um, it has a sing like a list of events, a list, a list of messages. And then I would have, have like a separate line somewhere at the top subscribing to the message broker. And the way it's designed is to make sure that like if there's a thousand apps described, uh, subscribe to the same 
um, event stream, only a single one is going to get at the event. So, um, so that's the way it would be to um, sort of uh, manage this. So, for example, perhaps insert the user and then have like a verification email sender, which is subscribed to the, like, the user creation event and only one email would, email would be sent. So, um, so yeah, so that's something that I was just thinking about a bit, but um, yeah, so, but I said like, it's just something to keep in mind, but um, obviously we don't need it at the moment because, you know, Aravind doesn't have a lot of users and uh, things are changing very fast. So um, yeah, maybe it's going to be completely removed in the future. So uh, maybe it's, you know, best not to over-engineer things in, in the beginning. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I have a question. Uh, I was wondering, right. okay, now that I like kind of get why we, we will use a message broker, like at what point do you consider that this is actually a viable choice? Let's say for actually making the switch to using a message broker and um, scaling up. I mean, uh, let's say, even if it's an arbitrary number of users, I mean, I just, I guess like I don't know at which point a simple service like this will just get bogged down by requests. Um, yeah, well, I don't know. It's um, well, so so two things. Um, one is that um, I don't know a single node app. Um, it's quite efficient actually, so it can probably you know handle I don't know at least thousands of requests per second per per, per, per minute maybe. Um, Maybe even even hundreds of thousands. Um, I guess it depends how you how you write it. But then there's other um, uh, sort of um, uh, things that, for example, even if you don't have a million users, uh, like running two processes is already advantageous because obviously one process can go down, or maybe we can have you know two containers on different servers. One server goes down users don't notice it's just you know forward to a different container so this is something that you know we can't really do at the moment um so so yeah it's, it's not just about like scaling to lots of users but also just making everything more robust and more parallelized and decoupled and um so yeah there are a lot of benefits yeah uh yeah okay that makes a lot of sense thanks I have sorry yeah another another question. Um, some something uh, that I I I always been told and uh, like bearing in mind I'm I'm I've been always on the dev side and not not on the ops side of the, of the story uh, is that like 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 uh, probably a, a, any any code base could be simply Dockerized or something like that. Um, I'm wondering if that's that's exactly true, and I guess it's not based on the on the example that you're giving. And which are the considerations that all of us as, as developers we should consider at the moment we're building some some code base uh, to make sure that uh, at any moment in the future we, where we want to Dockerize uh, that code base, uh, we don't have a ton of work to or or things to tweak or adjust. Maybe it's uh, not easy to answer in, in, in a single yeah, line, yeah. but a, but you know uh, it will be um, it will be good to, to explore that. Um, so yeah, so I think the the previous slide is like a very good example. Um, mm -hmm. So like, why why do we use containers in the first place? Is that um, you know it's very nice to have like this very small specific uh you know processes that are doing one thing very well you know this is like the unix philosophy it's it's always much easier to debug like one specific thing rather than like a monolith with a million lines of code um so so yeah when you think about containers you just think about like dividing your um application into like uh specific um well and specific roles um and one specific thing to think about, I think, is the process, because that process is really like, like all these Kubernetes and and like other types of orchestrators. I mean, obviously, Kubernetes is most 
software. They're very good at taking care of a single process in a container. If you have more processes, then it's not really ideal. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I guess another thing is, is useful to think about is the state. Like, where do you keep your files? So obviously, container is something that's like, it's useful to think about it as something that's very short-lived. You know, you can create a container, destroy a container, create 100 containers, scale to 1,000 containers. So you have to be careful about the state. Um, like, where do you keep your data? So you should not save anything locally ever, like, if you can. Sometimes it's inevitable. Um, like, for example, we have Ethereum containers, which have local SSDs, because you just need, you know, ridiculously fast um, disk writes, but whenever you can, just always use some external database or something like that, that, you know, your container it just becomes completely replaceable. Um, so, yeah, those would be two things if I would have to, like, say things that are most important. Make sure it's focused and make sure uh, you don't have local state, I would say. Those are the most important things. If you have these, then, yeah, no problem. We just write a Docker file. Upload the registry, the plot to Kubernetes, done like in, in, in 10 minutes. I have a question. If you, if you can go back or forth to the other slide. With that example, you, you should, uh, no, like forward, right? The, the email one, the database, okay. yeah. Here, if you, assuming that you only have one copy of the database, because we don't need replication, I guess. It's not so big, but we're doing. If if the data if you're having your database a unique key for the address, then why would it be a problem? Like there's no way you can insert insert that twice. You know what I mean? In, in like in, in the row in the middle when you insert, if you have a unique key and you just check the if it errored or not, so you don't send the uh, email in yeah. that it was a failure. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a good point. This is a unique key, so the query would fail. Um, mm. But you know, you would have to be like very, very, very careful everywhere, like across your database. So um, you know, maybe your code base has a thousand queries. Are you checking unique key in every single case? Um, mm. You know, probably not. And and um, yeah, as I said, you know, mm. another another solution is to have like atomic transactions, so you mm -hmm. just lock the database, execute your action, yeah. and then unlock it. But then again, that's quite complicated. So um, like, if mm -hmm. we need to scale to multiple processes, I think that message broker is just much easier to reason about. It's just mm -hmm. you have yeah. a list of events. Only one process can pull an event at the same time, you know, and then you can do whatever you want with it. Multiple queries, unique keys, no unique keys, doesn't matter. So yeah. Hmm. One last question, if I if I may, El, in the right. two two slides before the the one of the one repo file, oh. uh, I wonder what how do you these services that or these uh, processes that are running, how do you uh, tell them what to do to the to the container? Is this part of the configuration of the Docker file? Uh, so the Docker file is just this, which is basically just copying and installing all the software in the container. Um, but then uh, everything else is just like you would run it locally, right? So you have your package JSON, you have your learner JSON, and you know, learner has some comments, uh, package JSON, we have some you know, NPM scripts here. So this is just what we do. Um, so it's it's like a completely normal app, um, and you just sort of stuff everything into the Docker file. But uh, like the way the app functions is is not much different. So yeah, so in here, just you know, Lerna has like multiple packages, um, single comment executes a specific package. So app executes the app, server executes the server. And you know, etc. Is this clear? Yeah, yeah. I was 
my main uh, wonder was the when you have the container running how how it knows how uh, does it know uh, when each of the so, actions need to be uh, triggered so the so yeah so the container itself is not doing anything by itself right you need to somehow execute it so it's just a bunch of code just a bunch of files uh, okay and then yeah and then you tell it what to do using one of these comments so i can go to the Nice. Yeah, I can go, for example, to my Argon infrastructure repo. Um, uh, yeah, let's see. Uh, core backend. Uh, I have this guy here. So blah, blah, there's just a bunch of stuff here. But uh, basically, it's this. So I have my container, my comment, and my arguments. So that's it. That's how I tell it what to do. So npm run server, npm run server, start services, sorry. And yeah, that's it. Right. So, and, it, and this is just the package JSON. So it's, it's okay. not that complicated. Nice. Yeah, that was the, the main thing that I was missing. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to another topic. So uh, testing. So why do we want to test? Which is something that you know may not be obvious. Um, obviously, it improves correctness. Um, you define some very specific outcomes which you expect from your code. If the test fails, the code behaves as as you intended. Um, it also encourages code mod modularity. So this is something that's it's a bit difficult to sort of um, conceptualize until you actually start doing tests, but you will immediately see like which code is modular and which code is not. And if the code is not modular, it's just a real pain in the ass to try to test it. So um, if you're just writing tests, you know, from the beginning, then you really sort of encourage starting to make yourself, trying to make your, your life easier by making your code modular. So I think it just encourages better practices. And we all want modular code, of course. Um, also, it gives you more confidence when we're factoring. Um, obviously, imagine you have a million lines of code. You change some some one part. Maybe it can affect 100 other parts. If you have tests, then you're confident. If you're not, then you really have no idea if it's going to work or not. And it, I think it actually saves development time later on because, like, imagine you have 10 different API endpoints and you have no tests, then every change you would probably have to, like, run all those endpoints manually. So that, I don't know, that's five minutes. Let's say you have 10 updates, that's 50 minutes. You know, over a year, you're, you're spending many, many, many hours, you know, testing your stuff manually. So it's sort of maybe a bit slower when you just start, but it just quickly starts saving you time. So I would encourage testing from the very beginning. Um, so I wanted to say, just give a couple of examples of like non-testable code um, and and good testable code. So this is the, the same example that I showed before. Um, so this is actually, like this is quite difficult to unit test because like, let's say I have this function, I want to report it in the test, but I have this model. And this model depends on the database. So um, like, this is not ideal. Like, how would I test this? Um, I could maybe try mocking the model somehow. Um, I could try mocking the database, like importing some deep modules, you know. Um, but it's actually very complicated. So in order to make it easier, I actually, I just don't do unit tests in this case. I do integration tests by just spinning up the database. So I can show you right here. So yeah, this is my test thing. Um, so I'm using Docker Compose. So this is my server. So I do npm run server, and this actually depends on the database container, which is quite easy to do, you know, because that's another um, bonus of containers, because like I can just pull a database container, use it in my tests, and then yeah, here I just go Docker Compose up just wait the database and then run my tests. So then I'm able to actually execute this and there's no need to like mock my 
my models, mark my database, but then this becomes a kind of an integration test, not a unit test. Um, so, I mean, this, maybe this was like sufficient for me. Um, like personally, I find integration tests probably more useful than unit tests because it's kind of um, close to the client. Um, and um, yeah, this, well, this was working quite well, but that's just something to keep in mind that if you write it like this, then it's just very, very problematic to like have a unit test for this. Um, so how do you have unit tests? Well, I have another example. Um, you use dependency injection. That's really great. I mean, like for example, I have this uh, try send notification function and I just separate everything, I specify everything as, you know, dependencies. So maybe you don't want to have like a hundred different arguments. So I avoid that by just having a single context argument, for example. This context argument has my logger, my metrics, and in the test file, I just, you know, provide this kind of argument to my function and it's like super easy to test. So I can have multiple contexts for the same function. I can, you know, execute it with like completely executed multiple times. All my tests are independent, which is something also you have to think about. Like, for example, in this case, if I would like try to mock the database, it actually sort of breaks all the other functions because like maybe you want to mock your module in one test but then you need the module functioning in the other test and it breaks so you need to like execute multiple tests and multiple processes maybe and it just becomes very very painful um so yeah dependency injection is i think it's it's just it's just great um it's very easy to test and also your code just becomes incredibly modular because now you can have any code base in any project you just import this function you pass everything you need as arguments there's not going to be like any side effects nothing i mean it's just very clean and contained so um so yeah that's i i really like the dependency injection um so there's also people talk about uh, test-driven development. So this is sort of uh, making tests, like pushing testing to the to the limits, and you can actually start thinking about tests first and implement implementation second. So like an in an interesting um, side effect of this is that tests can actually be used as your spec. So this is, for example, a prompter. Um, this is a prompter module. So th this is a uh, uh, yeah, this is just a project for Prometheus metrics in your node apps. And they have, for example, like a bunch of code here, like some module, and you have this spec file. So, okay, so I want to open the spec. And what is inside the spec? Well, this is actually just a just test file. So you just look at this test file and you can kind of, you can kind of, it's kind of like documentation, you know, so you can see like what's, which function is supposed to do what and like what's supposed to be the outcome of those functions. So this can almost serve as the documentation, you know? So yeah, I really like this approach. It's, uh, it's kind of smart. Um, so yeah, like imagine you, um, you want to write some functions, you need those functions to do like, a, like, I don't know, have some kind of feature. So you define a test and then your test fails, and then you keep coding until your test passes. So I think that's an interesting approach. Um, so yeah, I, I've tried doing this as well, but well, like I don't know, I haven't been um, I haven't been a backend developer for a long time. So um, like I don't know, do you have any thoughts on this? Like how do you test the front ends, for example? We don't. Uh, Brett, maybe you no, want to say something. That's like yeah. <laughs> no tests. <laughs> no tests. So, yeah, to be fair, like in, in many ways, I think, in, especially in the front end, integration and end to end tests are much more valuable. Um, and to do TDD with uh, an, an end to end test is just a non starter. Like, <laughs> so, um, that, that particularly makes it difficult. Um, but there are certain things like in terms of uh, small little modules, like pure functions, especially, it is sometimes really, really helpful. Uh, for example, we just had um, we just had a display library 
uh, for formatting a bunch of numbers into a displayable form. And that's a really great example where everything is basically pure. You get input and you're expected to provide output in a certain format. And with that, you like the way I even think about it sometimes is not even to like think about what to describe. It's just like, oh, I'm li like uh, missing, um, uh, like missing a missing a spec. I'm missing kind of a an input form. So um, you can write tests and make sure you're handling those, <coughs> and then you you can run those afterwards. And that's kind of like TDD. Uh, but again, it's really hard to do this with a real front end. Uh, where you, the front end isn't rendered yet. Yeah. Um, well, I guess you can still like, um, yeah, yeah, I imagine, yeah. Some a quick quick uh, tip for um, for any, any of us that want to do some pair programming. Uh, a nice exercise that we can start doing uh, uh, since you already know that I love <laughs> testing uh, and I'm a big fan of TV in particular, um, is to um, write one, one, <laughs> one person who write the, the failing test and they'll work, mm -hmm. the, the, the other one can make it pass and then you, you, you switch the roles. And it's a really, really fun way to do programming while testing. So, for then in mind. Oh, you mean like one person like, writes the test and then another writes the implementation. Yeah, so, yeah, well, basically, as you said, the idea of TDD is first write a fail, failing test and then make it pass and then refactor and then go go right. and do that over and over again until you have the full feature implemented. So if you want to scale a, a programming session and you want to do some testing as well, something that we could try is uh, is that doing that exercise. I, I did it before and it's quite fun. Uh, so I don't know if you and I are, we're doing some programming for for a new endpoint for the code backend. I can implement the 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 failing test. You make it pass, then you write the second test. I make it pass, and then yeah, you keep yeah, going. that's a good example. Yeah, yeah, I like that. It's a good idea. Yeah. There's also um, um, to to add to this in terms of practicing TDD. It's not really practicing, but it's like learning a language, I guess. Um, a really popular technique is cones, K-O-A-N-S, uh, where you pretty much like people already provide tests that you're supposed to pass afterwards. Uh, so I can, uh, yeah, testing. Uh, yeah, do K-O-A-N-S. Oh. Cones, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> it's it's yeah, from yeah. a Buddhist, I think, uh, background. But if you exactly yeah, put programming in, mm. into it, I tried the Ruby cones once. Back then. All right. Yeah. Um, I was thinking, um, Andy, maybe you have something to add, like. Um, you worked at the normal company the longest probably. So you have some uh, tricks for testing the front end? Uh, I think it's interesting because like in the front end, it's there's a bit more contention around testing versus I, I'd say work with back end devs. It's, I'd say that the front end is trickier for, for some of the reasons that um, Brett mentioned, but also it, it feels to me like certain front end devs, like take dependency injection as an example, um, Certain people want, they don't like necessarily changing the way they write code to to to, to fit a, a better sort of testing strategy. Um, and I, I was going to really ask, you know, what your perspective is on on that, or, or ways to, um, you know, to, to really show the value of something like that. Because I think um, when, when you're using a lot of say dependency injection, and you've got to have these cool sites, you've got to inject everything you need, like. It's easy to say, okay, well, you know, why do why why do I keep need to doing this over and over again? They feel like it's 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 you know it's maybe not not ideal, but um, like getting into that that kind of way of working, like you said, with TDD it doesn't work as well on the front end. I, I find personally, but like in terms of advocating for like an architecture that is testable, like you know, are there any sort of tips you'd have from a back end perspective that you, you know you would you would maybe offer to to front end? Um, well. 
well yeah it's it's a bit difficult um to uh, yeah because you know the front end it has to be rendered um the back end doesn't need to be rendered so that's a big one um so yeah i guess like i guess in terms of testing if if uh, like i don't know how viable it is to um you know to isolate all of the logic um from your actual you know web components um just you know test it as much as you can so um yeah so cones cones is the, cones is the way as Peter saying but uh yeah as i said um it's it's difficult for me to uh to translate this knowledge into the front end so i can i can tell about the back end um that um i think we'll have uh, we'll have we, we have like many such small examples with uh with faku at the beginning uh like when something breaks and we have no idea why and we just spend like half a day you know trying to figure out like what's wrong and if we just had a test then we would save like you know half a day of, of, of work um so for the back end like the 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 positives are immediate and for the front end well i can't really talk much about the front end so not much input yeah. there yeah no that's fair i think i guess for me as well i just came off a project um at the last place where um, they went incredibly heavy on the on the testing um, on the granular unit level, and uh, it, it was incredibly painful. And they would break every five seconds. So, like you kind of have to move a bit further up the pyramid, really, with the integration. And like end to end is incredibly valuable on the front end and visual regression and stuff, and, and making sure that you're composing that, um, you know, in pure components. It, it certainly helps on the front end, but there's there's a bit of a dance I find, and I'm still I'm still trying to zero in on on a, you know a really good. Sort of solid front end testing strategy because because it, it can be can be tricky for sure mm -hmm. yeah so for example what i did here for the back end um it, like it's the same thing especially when we are sort of um you know experimenting a lot um like if i would have a unit test for every single thing then <laughs> well my experience with that experiments would end because you know you wouldn't <laughs> be able to change anything um so uh, like what well, well for example for the server right so i have my server i have a bunch of api endpoints so i found that doing an integration test is like much more useful to rather than a unit test so for example i have this uh this test here so i just uh start my server on localhost and then i just hit my api endpoints and expect some you know json response so i have complete freedom like over my functions uh like in the actual backend as long as i get that response which you know kind of makes sense i mean users don't really care how my backend is functioning even like what kind of language i'm using um so i have complete freedom to sort of change things and experiment a lot but that you know that api response has to be correct so so for example this is the abstraction that i found to be suitable and I don't really have any unit tests at the moment, at least for what I did. So, uh, just this kind of higher level integration tests. Um, um, but uh, I was thinking, like, for some specific parts, um, uh, which have, uh, for example, some complicated logic. Um, so, I have this session middleware, for example. Um, I have this uh, object objection um, session store, and it has a bunch of these functions here. And for example, this is not tested. So like this is you know quite a complicated component. So maybe I would write better you know to write a unit test for this. Uh, but just don't don't go crazy over it. Um, like I don't I, I wouldn't say that you know you know hundred percent code coverage or 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 nothing. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's a bit of a dance, as you said. Like, um, it's it's hard to say. I mean, if it would be easy, then you know people wouldn't be arguing about it, right? <laughs> so, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's it's complicated to say like how much testing is correct, so that you still can you know refactor fast, but um, also make sure things are not breaking. So, yeah. Yeah, I'd also say definitely with um with unit tests, I think a lot of a lot of people that are new to testing start with unit tests because it's like the most easily reachable ones and everyone tells you to do unit tests. 
And then what I feel like most people do is they get really heavy on unit tests and mocks and they find that their tests are actually really brittle and really useless versus integration and end-to-end -end test. Um, and I, I just right. have seen this pattern with developers where you, you like take someone and you're like, you should do tests. And they're like, great, let me do all the testing I can do. And they'll start with like unit tests and, and mocks. And then eventually through their career, they are just like, yeah, I think that was kind of a phase where I outgrew that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so the way I like to think about it is um, like when I'm programming anything, um, I think about a goal, right? So like, w what are you trying to achieve with this? It's not just, you know, coding for fun. You're trying to sort of accomplish a business goal. So you should just start writing code. If, if things break and you see that, you know, writing some tests speeds time and, you know, then you should write tests. But if there are so many tests that you cannot refactor anything, then maybe there are too many tests. So you just have to focus on the goal and, and um, just go from there, I would say. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good point. And, and just uh, like dogmatism can really affect you in this way, especially if you have some principles ingrained in people. Um, so yeah, just just kind of be pragmatic about that. It makes a lot of sense. Now, uh, I do want okay. to talk about dependency injection, Martinez, because um, I, I I don't mind dependency injection. And Andy, you may also have um, a different feeling about this. I'm not sure if Angular past two uh, did a lot of dependency injection, but that was like a huge nerve point for a lot of Angular 1 developers, where dependency injection would just kind of make your thing really difficult to test, but also just really hard to figure out what was actually getting done uh, in a service or in a yeah, in a model. Uh, but uh, so one, one example, and this is kind of coming from our own uh, company um, history is, we had a lot of problems with dependency injection in the CLI uh, because we would just stuff a lot of things into the context and you would never know like what was actually in that context at a particular point in time. Mm -hmm. uh, so because of this, I, I say like dependency injection is really, I think useful if you like have specific things that you are putting into the context. Uh, but if you're just like throwing things into the context <laughs> as like the carryover parameter, it gets really slippery really quickly. Uh, <laughs> To know what's going on. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I, I see. I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, so, um, so yeah. If if you, if there's too many, um, if there's too much stuff in, in the context, then it's it's kind of like a hidden, like a hidden global state, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, you just pass. You're just passing it in function, but it's basically a global state. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty sure I will have like many more discussions about how to test. You know, <laughs> it's a never-ending discussion. Um, um, uh, but but yeah, it's like maybe maybe you just have to think about how your, your code is going to be used, um, and if you think that this might be useful anywhere else, then you might want to you know have like a pure function with with arguments and. And um, yeah, well, I don't know, like how to, like what's the what the speed sweet spot? It's hard to say. So in this case, for example, my context is just very specific. It's just for logging and metrics. So like, I'm quite happy with using this. Um, um, so maybe at some point we would have to use something different. Not sure, but this has been working so far. Any other thoughts on testing? Okay, so I'm gonna move to CI/CD. Um, so continuous integration, continuous delivery. Um, so why? Um, well, first of all, fewer bugs with mandatory tests. So uh, this is what we have for the backend. So whenever we push push something, it has to pass a test. And until the best passes, you cannot deploy. So that's, you know, I think that's obvious, the benefits of that. I mean, we don't want to break stuff in production. It's much better to break it during the test. Um, also, it just saves you a lot of repetitive tasks. Um, so like, for example, imagine you're deploying things manually and 
you know, you do it once, it's fine. Um, but then you do it 10 times, you do it 100 times, maybe, you know, every deployment, you know, makes takes you five, six minutes. So that's what you just wasted 10 hours doing nothing but, you know, manual, manual deployments. Um, so yeah, just automate everything, everything you can just really save, save time in the long run, I think. And of course, if you save time, you're going to go be faster to market, be the competitors, which is always good. Um, so yeah, these are just some examples what I automate, um, uh, what I automated for the core backend. Um, so, so uh, email templates. Uh, so yeah, we have these uh, email templates um, for sending the emails. Um, previously, people were sort of copy pasting them into the into the into the Postmark server. This is all automatic now. You don't have to worry about it. Do a pull request, push. All your templates are updated. Um, also, I'm updating these dashboards in Kubernetes. Um, I'm also running tests on every single commit. So. Um, yeah, basically, if we just go to, we just go to core backend. Uh, so I'm using GitHub Actions for this, uh, which is quite nice. If you don't know this, like GitHub now. Um, I think this was done by Microsoft because you know Microsoft bought GitHub and they have this cool thing. Um, you know, they have their own Azure cloud and. Uh, was, I think it's Azure DevOps, something like that. Azure DevOps, yeah, anyway. Basically, they had this cloud um, solution which just automates all different things. And I think that after they bought GitHub, they're trying to bring all of this stuff into GitHub, which is you know, awesome. So we have this great service completely for free. Uh, we can automate anything we want. So here you see all of these jobs that are running here. So every single Every single commit that you push is going to give you immediate feedback, like are your tests passing? And then uh, what I did is uh, specific branches uh, get deployed to specific um, environments. So um, so in our, our case, uh, where is it? Um, yeah, so these are the workflow flies. It's just you just define them on .github. And these are like very simple, very, very simple uh, YAML files, uh, just list of tasks. Uh, this can be specific um, uh, GitHub action scripts, or it can be just a bash script, which is what I have here. Just run some Kubernetes commands, and this one updates the dashboard. And whenever I, yeah, so this, okay, so whenever I upload this file, I run this script. So this can be like branch specific or path specific or tag specific, etc. So for example, this is for emails. So anytime I change the email path, I run this script, which just syncs to the Postmark server. And these are the big ones. So for the testnet, um, uh, so any branch that is not master, I'm running the tests. Uh, so build. So build is, yeah, so build is for building the Docker file, test is for running the tests. And then if the branch is development, then I also deploy it to the Kubernetes, uh, to the staging server. So as you can see, this is pretty cool. It's quite flexible. Um, so yeah, I've been using it, I'm enjoying it a lot, automating stuff, so that's great. And then we have a separate one for the master tags. So whenever we have like V point something tag, we push it to production with that specific version. And you can see it here. So for example, there is this bug that I fixed, fixed just two hours ago, um, which is define a tag. And then this workflow just pushes the container to the, to the cluster. Well, you just have to do like a bunch of Kubernetes commands here. And yeah, so that's just saves a lot of time. So, you know, my development is just, I just push and that single push can execute like many, many things like synchronize Postmark server, like deploy my dashboards, deploy to Kubernetes, run tests and yeah, it's great. So 
what what kind of automation flows do you use for the for the front end? Like um, I, I remember read that for example for the court front end you were um, uh, creating different environments for every single branch, I think, right? Yeah, we've uh, had a couple of different models. And in fact, what we do on our Versal deployed front ends uh, is really a hack because Versal doesn't support multiple environments very well. Um, we use actions when things get merged into master to kick off a bunch of Versal deployments for different environments. Uh, and particularly the environments we have are between different chains. So when you have a Rigby chain and a mainnet chain and other staging environments, um, every time you, you merge against master, those are just automatically uh, published. And then with the Versal GitHub app, uh, that integration, we usually choose a staging uh, version to test against. And, and again, once the test goes well, um, the, the, you get basically a, a pull or a front end per pull request uh, that you can play with and test, and then you can merge it afterwards. Um, I've been trying to do something similar for like a while that's been like kind of just sitting there uh, with the client to move it completely onto Versal as well. So we have a nightly build for the client. Um, I've been meaning to do so for the apps as well. So the apps would have a nightly version. And then we've been also discussing how to move our current deployments that are completely chain based into versatile deployments and using the chain deployments more as like a backup, uh, like a particular point release at a specific point in time, uh, rather than being like the official version that, um, that people are using. Uh, but otherwise, I think in terms of the front end, there hasn't been so much automation. There's like a couple of cool things with, um, I think with GitHub annotations and linting and things like that, that have just kind of popped up. Uh, we might also try to integrate some more services um, like visual regression, end-to-end -end tests uh, using CI, but those have kind of been, been things that I've, we haven't started on. Oh, the other thing that we use a lot of automation on is, uh, is GitHub pages. So I think a lot of our uh, microsites and other pages, um, we have an action to publish into production on every, every change. And that has honestly saved so much time. <laughs> Instead of asking one person mm. to be like, yo, can you deploy this? Uh, with like the shared secrets and whatnot, um, it's usually just as simple as uh, triggering a build. Um, and I think one thing I'd add with CI and CD is that managing secrets, it's much easier with CI CD. Uh, and I particularly feel this with a client where we have a couple of secrets and I need to decrypt those secrets every time I deploy. And I've honestly forgot many times where I've had to redeploy twice. Uh, pay transaction fees because I forgot the first time and I'm testing it. I'm like, ah, oh, shit, I forgot that environment variable. <laughs> Let me go decrypt this and, and then start the build again. Whereas in CI CD, you can make sure that your, those secrets are coupled into your environment uh, and you don't have to worry about it afterwards. Yeah, definitely. So yeah, in here, for example, I have my Kubernetes secrets uh, just defined in GitHub Actions. So we could also have like, I don't know, private keys executing some transactions in CICD, no problem. So um, so yeah, like if, if you haven't been using GitHub Actions, I highly recommend it. It's just, it's just very easy. As you can see, it's just a YAML file, a bunch of functions. Uh, execute whatever you want. It's great. Okay, so the final topic. Um, is metrics. Um, so yeah, so why do we want to have metrics? Um, well, first of all, it's graphs pro provide a better overview than logs. Like maybe you've already experienced this when you try to debug something and you have a thousand logs and yeah, maybe you can grip it and try finding the error. But if you could just have like a very nice graph, seeing the peak, you know, two hours ago, it's like completely clear where was the problem. And then you sort of um, use logs as a higher level, a more specific investigation. So this is the tool that I like to use. This just sort of um, starts with a very high level abstract kind of metrics, and then you narrow down to a specific logs to see like what, what is the issue. Um, it's also easy to define alerts. Um, 
let's say I have alert for like HTTP errors. Uh, maybe I see that there was a spike in HTTP errors, and see, I immediately send an alert. Um, and that's not really something you can do, like using logs. And yeah, it's also I think it's it's easier debugging um, because of what I just mentioned. Um, so what do you actually want to measure? Um, so so think about when your application is going down, um, and you would want to bring it back up as fast as you can, what will you look for? And then you will gonna have an answer like what's what's the right thing to measure. So obviously the number of requests, number of errors is a good start. So yeah, yeah number of errors is probably what you know the most the most useful metric of all. So for example I have this worker. Um, whenever it's run, I increment a metric. Whenever it's success I increment a metric, and if there's an error, I also increment a metric. So, um, and yeah, that's that's a good start. So, um, so the way the way I structure this is uh, sort of high level status first, and then the graphs, and then the logs. So, this is the moment that you've been all been waiting for. See some live graphs. Uh, <laughs> so let's load up the core backend dashboard. Um, and um, yeah, I really like the Grafana, the way that they do things. Um, just creating these type of dashboards is just very easy and it's rewarding, you know, just to see everything functioning at the end. It's, it's, uh, it's really great. And, um, and I think I've mentioned this before, but like Grafana as a company, it's, they're just doing things great. Um, um, just, just in general, the way they write things, the way they structure things, the way they're like completely embracing open source, and also, for example, this thing, this is built using React components. Like you can just drag everything, you know, rearrange. It's just completely like flexible and, yeah, really amazing. And you can just like export everything, uh, just using JSON. So all of these complicated graphs are just. It's just a JSON file, so yeah, it's, it's, it's great. So the way I define this is um, I have my uptime metric at the top. So like imagine you just, like a user complains that something is wrong, you don't know what, so you open this, first of all, you see the uptime, like is your server actually running? That's good. But then you wanna drill to more specifics, like okay, what kind of HTTP status codes do I get? Like what kind of, um, errors I get, maybe there's like a specific path which is giving me errors. And then, um, yeah, this is for my server runs. So for example, this is a bug that I found just like a couple of hours ago. I had this service worker notification sender give me errors. So I can immediately go, okay, I know where's the problem. Then I go like into the logs at the bottom and I can see like a very specific log somewhere here which is causing me the issues, yeah, here we go. So like this kind of debugging flow that I really I really like, just gives you this immediate feedback. So for example, we have these status codes. Uh, these are the server responses. So uh, like, let's do some, let's break things. <laughs> uh, let's say I want to do um, core backend.aragon.org and I should get an error because uh, yeah, I should probably get a course error for this. Uh, here we go. So if I go back to my dashboard, in a second now, here we go. So we see immediately um, I'm getting an error and, oh, it's also trying to get a five icon. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, as you see, like the, the metrics are just very, very variable. Like, you know, trying to grab my metrics manually would be just really painful, but Thanks to Grafana, um, yeah, it's just it's just great. Also, very rewarding just to see this kind of you know uh, pretty graphs and stuff. So <laughs> it's uh, the, the fun part of the backend. Uh, <laughs> very rewarding. Um, so um, so yeah, I think that's it for today. I don't have any more slides. So if you have any questions or comments, thanks for staying so long. Um, yeah, I think it wraps up of wraps up today. Right 
Um, I, I have a question. I guess it's more sort of a, a personal experience, uh, Martinez. It's, uh, you, you said you weren't super familiar with Node before, say, three, four months ago. Like, you know, how long did it take until you really felt like you were sort of cooking on cooking on gas, like you actually felt pretty proficient and, and you know, things were going well? Uh, maybe like a month, I would say. Um, there was like a lot of uh, back and forth, um, uh, like especially from Faco and Brett, um, uh, like simple things like, you know, async functions, um, like the structuring, like all this fancy JavaScript stuff that I wasn't familiar with. Um, so yeah, I can actually see, uh, let's see. Um, I have some insights here. So I think I started, um, where do I see, okay, the contributors. So, uh, yeah, let's see. So, so I started somewhere like mid March. I think it was going like quite slow. And then like in April, I really started ramp ramping up and, and, um, pushing more commits. So, yeah, I think it was about a month. Um, just, just uh, um, yeah, but I mean, I, I did some programming before, so like it wasn't like programming from scratch. Um, uh, but I also wasn't like familiar with the sync functions and, and that kind of stuff. So yeah, I would say a month to just, if you're invested, um, yeah, I think I think that's, that's about right. Yeah, no, that's cool. Yeah, I'm just interested. I, I kind of want to do. I want to dabble a bit more in, in sort of back end nodey stuff, just on the side. But mm -hmm. I'm never really bothered to well, see that. If you already know JavaScript, then yeah, it's going to be, you know, maybe a few days for you. So because uh, you know it's the same JavaScript in the back end. So yeah, just need to think about about this like Docker stuff and, and you know uh, running processes. So. Um, yeah, well, that's, I guess that's also quite complicated, but I was familiar with that stuff from before. So, um, yeah, I was basically just learning JavaScript. That was like the main pain point for me. Um, uh, but in terms of all the other stuff, well, I mean, there's a profession of site reliability engineer, so you can be full time just, you know, figuring out how containers work and how Kubernetes works. Uh, so, yeah, that's a lot of stuff. Um, but the way, the way I like to set this up, um, which is also a point about automation and stuff, um, is that um, I have these CI CD pipelines. So you don't really need to think about, you know, containers and, and like Kubernetes and stuff, because, you know, this is all automated. So you just, you just push the code and you will see the tests uh, pass or fail, and you will see deployments pass or fail. So it will just just run fine. So um, yeah, if you're familiar with the JavaScript, you could start contributing right away. I would say. Yeah. Thanks, hey, man. Jim. Yeah. Sorry, go. On. Something kind of related to this topic is uh, just the backend stack. Um, and Martinez, you did quite a bit of research and an investigation into uh, like kind of what's available. And I wanted to see if you could give a breakdown into the, some of the choices, um, especially because we're probably going to use the same ones unless uh, there's significant reasons not to um, for Node. Um, um, yeah. So, okay. So what do we use? Um, so first of all was the API server. So I guess the, like what I like to do is I like to um, sort of see which things are, um, which kind of things are popular, um, but not like, you know, there are some things which sort of jump in popularity and then everyone forgets about them a few months ago. So if like, if they're kind of uh, like frameworks which were kind of popular and like stay popular for maybe, I don't know, a couple of years, um, that's when I like to adopt them. Um, so in, in terms of, um, like backend frameworks, for example, um, um, yeah. So for example, this, this site is quite nice stage of state of gs.com. Um, so yeah, so for example, express, it was pretty much a good choice for like many years and 
API is still functioning fine. There's like tons of libraries, tons of packages available for it. So that's a very good um, default choice. Um, I don't know, really know about uh, Next.js. Um, um, I think Meteor was a good example, but it was like really interesting and and you know, just like somehow they managed to execute the same code both in the back end and in the front end. So that was quite interesting, but um, I don't think that actually a lot of people are using it. And what I also like to experiment with is Koa. So Koa was a sort of an evolution of Express. Uh, it was actually by the creators of Express. And the advantage of it is that it has, um, it's basically uh, a sync, uh, it's, it's native support for all the sync functions. So yeah, you can do a lot of stuff with it. Um, so yeah, yeah, here, here agrees that Koa is great. <laughs> Yeah, I really, I really like it. So, like for for the next back backend project, I will probably use this. Um, I think I have like some middleware gifs, uh, which was great. Oh yeah, I love this. So okay, so we have like a bunch of middleware, and you can actually await on the next function. So well, I don't know if you're familiar with Express, but next you just sort of fire it and. Um, you don't really know where it goes next, but here it's like very granular control. You wait until the next, then it jumps to this guy, then it jumps to this guy and goes back. So there's a lot of stuff that we can do with this, like at the top, um, like measuring, uh, like, I don't know, measuring the request time, defining metrics, defining logs, error handling. Um, it really like saves a lot of stuff. Um, and there's also actually where I copied the CTX object in my, in my, in my tests. <laughs> For dependency injection, uh, yeah, that's uh, useful. So yeah, I like this. Um, then we also used um, uh, what else did we use? Uh, yeah, for the database. Um, so yeah, so for the database. Um, <laughs> okay, nice. Yeah, here know that they used to sync away. Yeah, so for me this. Is like main. So yeah, so for me this is like the main. The main um, attraction of of Koa that it's like a sync a sync await native, um, so it's great. Um, yeah, for the for the for the database, um, I really like this uh, connect thing. Um, so um, so there is this concept of um, what was it uh, object something. Um, ORM, yeah, that's it, that's what I'm looking for. Um, like people are really into ORMs um, for the database. So in terms of uh, defining your database in terms of, in, in terms of objects, but the problem I, I found with this is that um, um, whenever, you, when you move to this uh, like ORM, then it, it's very nice when it does uh, what you need, but sometimes, you still need to write like a where this SQL query, which is not handled by ORM, and then you're back to like raw queries at the bottom. So this problem is it solved quite nicely using Connex. Um, so Connex is this uh, is this like a query builder thing. Um, so you have these type of functions, and every function. Um, uh, so it's, it's like a very, very thin wrapper above SQL queries. So it's like you're writing an SQL query in terms of this kind of jQuery type chain functions and basically to build your queries. And then on top of that, there's this uh, great thing called objection. So this is the thing that I was using for all my database needs in my backend. Um, so it takes this um, connects a query builder and just builds a bunch of relations on top of it. Um, so let's see if we can find something here, like real quick, like a quick example. Okay, so here's a good example. So I initialize my connect, uh, I initialize my SQL query, I define my model and and um, and yeah, basically that's it. So this is this gives me that like relational wrapping, uh, uh, like uh, object relation model that you expect from ORMs. 
But what's really great about objection is that if you need to write a raw query, you don't need to write a raw query because you have this connects available underneath. So uh, all your database functions, like even some very complicated, you know, weird queries, like everything is just JavaScript functions. So yeah, I really like using this like objection plus connects. It's it's great. Um, um, let's see what else we used. Um, so for testing, we used I think we used Mocha. Um, I think Jest is also great. Um, so I don't know, pick whatever you need. I don't have strong feelings for for either. Maybe Mocha is more flexible. Um, and just sort of a defined package, you get everything in one. So um, I kind of know what what kind of testing they use for the front end. We normally use Jest. Oh, you don't. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. yeah I've, seen that, I've seen that universally. It's kind of Jest and only. Yeah, yeah. Jest, Jest is fine. Um, uh, yeah, we used Mocha for the back end, but I actually saw people using Jest for the front ends as well. Um, so, for example, this Promster example that was showed. Uh, this is like for the back end metrics, and yeah, they're also using Jest. Works great. So. Yeah, maybe it's even nicer because, because yeah, when you use Mocha, you have to like import five different things and then sort of arrange them together. So, uh, just a bit more straightforward, I would say. Um, let's see. Did I miss something in the stack, Brad? I think, no, I think, I think that's pretty good. Uh, yeah, the, the next kind of thing I would kind of go into quickly, if we have the time, is to just go over uh, some of the alerts and how those are getting fed. Um, because the, the other part of metrics now where we're after this is just what do we do once we know about an error uh, and how do we find out about an error in the first place? Uh, like this. You wait for something to break, and then you create a <laughs> ticket saying alert for this, yeah, yeah, <laughs> which is exactly. what I did a <laughs> few hours ago. Um, so yeah, so this is a good example. Um, I was uh, I had this email sender um, uh, breaking, and I have this uptime metrics. So uptime metrics are handled by Kubernetes automatically. So if the server goes down, I will get an alert, but you can get this kind of situation where I have all these errors, my service is not functioning, and and there's no other. So so yeah. So in this case, for example, I would have define a threshold. If there's more error, like more than one error, maybe I will get an alert. So this is a very good like I would just draw a straight line somewhere here. And see, as long as it's above this error rate, then I will get an alert. So that's something like that um, that I will define, and and it's um, yeah, it's just um, yeah, it's hard to say. Um, like well, as your application grows, um, your metrics grow and your alerts grow together. I would say so. Yeah, it's just it's just a continuous process. Um, so yeah, um, alerting on errors. That's that's a good start, I would say. Um, and just go from there. I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah, I was going to say perhaps going into Ops Genie um, and how kind of the, all the flows are, are composed together uh, and kind of what it means to like not really operate, but like how does this whole thing kind of hook, get hooked up together and then how do you kind of respond to it from that perspective? Um, so the way it's hooked up together, um, there's quite a lot of parts. Um, so this is our infrastructure. I uh, just made this diagram a few days ago. Um, so as you see, like this is the core backend that I was function uh, talking about before. But you see, there's like all this context of all this around it. So um, yeah, there's the NAS, there's the database, and there's the lock metrics. So and then there's this whole monitoring stack here. So Grafana, it queries the logs, it queries the metrics, and then the, the uh, alerts from that are getting forwarded to Genie. And this is where 
operators get notified. So um, yeah, just define you just define your alerts. For example, in Prometheus, um, uh, sorry, in Kubernetes, when you do when you uh, let's see what hmm. for example. Yeah, but I like, what I like about Kubernetes is because there's a lot of tooling involved. I actually didn't define any alerts manually whatsoever. And there's a lot of stuff that I get alerted on automatically, which is great. Which is, you know, why, why people are using Kubernetes, because we can just take advantage of all these tools. And But for the remaining alerts, basically, you can just define YAML objects like this. So for example, in this case, uh, there's just a little rate of HTTP requests. If there's a status code for something, something, then I get an alert. So yeah, going back to the to the code example that I was showing, uh, I have this metric here, like worker error. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to define something like this. Uh, this is going to be like worker errors. Uh, more than, I don't know, one error in the past day, I generate an alert or something like that. Um, and just go from there. So yeah, so there's all this complicated infrastructure around it. But once you have it, then it's actually quite simple. It's just YAML files. <laughs> so sometimes I like to joke, like people ask me, what's my profession? I say, I'm a YAML engineer. <laughs> <laughs> Because yeah, there's a lot of YAML files like this, so yeah, it's quite it's quite quite easy when 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 it, when it's running. So, uh, yep. Yeah, so that's it. And then for actually alerting the users, we're using Ops Genie. So there's like a bunch of alerts in the past, and yeah, I just get an alert. It can be an email. It can be a phone notification. And then for the public, we're also using status page. So. Yeah, these things, they integrate quite nicely together. And uh, for the, wait, where was the, yeah, that's good. So yeah, I just have a bunch of components, um, a bunch of URLs. Um, and yeah, it's it, it integrates quite nicely. So I have like a bunch of alerts here, I can say, um, there's a, like an alert policy, for example. I say, okay, if there's a core backend in the alert name, then I need to update this status page component. And if something's wrong, then this component here is going to be updated for the public to see. So, um, so that's the that's our stack. Um, in terms of if you want to actually like. Um, write a new backend and you want to do this from scratch. So, really, what you have to do is all you have to do is uh, use this uh, metrics library, um, just import it, increment the metric, uh, deploy your app, then define this type of YAML file for what kind of alert, and like that's it. That's that's all you need to, to start going. Um, yeah, so it's it's quite nice. It's quite easy to do. Okay, so any other questions, comments? Yeah, I have a question uh, about uh, if uh, there, I know the, there is this other uh, tooling that is tenderly for check alerts and of the smart contracts. And I wonder if this is also something that you plan or are already integrated with a service uh, to get notification. Mm -hmm. No, we haven't. We haven't integrated. Um, so for for the moment, um, I I'm just um, uh, yeah. So for the moment, in terms of alerts, what I have right now is we just have these uptime metric alerts. So I get alerted if the server goes down. So generally speaking, if you know there's like a blockchain error or something, then the server will go down and you will see it. So. 
Um, uh, but yeah, in terms of defining alerts, uh, it's just a matter of like, uh, I guess it will be just a matter of um, like inserting this type of metric somewhere in your code. Like this, you know, could be like a metric for um, RPC requests, uh, successful requests, failed requests, and then you would just like have a graph and alerts on that one. So uh, yeah, we can we can have this, but um, just not something we just so so far. We we tried it, Gabby, uh, for for the our own court smart contracts, but but I think yeah, it's not related to uh, Docker or containers and all that. It's uh, okay. Brett probably can can give more more context. I I think you set it up. I only been a user to it. <laughs> Nice. Yeah, Tenderly is kind of like a whole different platform that we could eventually integrate with, but I think right now it's um, it, it doesn't really make sense to in terms of our own infrastructure. Uh, so with Tenderly, and I, I really do like them, um, they allow us to get like high level and high level operational idea of like how our contracts are doing. Um, in particular, there's failed transactions, or if something bad happens, like if an event we don't want happens, uh, we get emailed about that and, and we can kind of respond to that. Um, but it's really something that's like after the, the fact, um, and particular, particularly with our own software, um, right now our own smart contracts, uh, there's not like so much we can do outside of, uh, sometimes there's like a front end bug with DAS or something like that, that we've caught a couple of times with Tenderly. Um, but most of the time, it's like a user interaction issue. Um, so a lot of times, they're not like quite that actionable. Now, that obviously depends on the types of smart contracts you're interacting with. Some smart contracts uh, can really benefit from that observability. Um, another thing that like we could think about doing is Tenderly has like a whole different pipeline of um, of like on demand or like on chain interaction. Uh, tooling that they've started building out. So um, if we wanted notifications whenever a transaction was sent to one of our contracts, uh, they can provide that now in an automatic way. And um, that's particularly useful for things like if we were to rebuild the core backend, we could most likely redo it on top of some of 10 of these tools. Um, but then like, it, it doesn't really make, it's not so hard for us to do this in the first place, given our knowledge of Web3. Uh, and and all of our software tooling on top of the graph. Uh, but there are specific cases where it could be, I think, really, really interesting because we're piggybacking basically on top of their observability platform. Um, and like the most obvious one is notifications where we can build an entire notification stack uh, on top of them and, and just expect them to kind of handle all of the, the chain updates. Nice. So So I guess that's it for today. Thanks for staying for so long.